Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 164, On Counting Gods. In early December 2016, I had the privilege of giving a talk at Boston College. I was hosted by my friend, Dr. Daniel McCoy, who's an excellent philosopher of science and philosopher of religion. And the small group consisted of him and some of his graduate students. I've included the whole talk in this episode and even the whole Q&A. I thought the questions were excellent and reflect well on Dr. McCoy and his students and Boston College. In this talk, I go through some of the main ideas of my paper recently published called On Counting Gods. You can get that online. It's in the journal Theologica. There's a link to the whole paper in the blog post for this episode. Also, you might want to look at that blog post because I've posted some images from the slides I was using in this talk. There are some charts and diagrams that can be helpful to actually following what I'm saying here. The bottom line is this. I think the scheme atheism, monotheism, polytheism is confused because of multiple ambiguity in the term theism that's a part of those words. What do we mean by a god? And I separate out three different things that can be meant, and I suggest a revision in this terminology. Without further ado then, over to me. Hi folks, thanks for having me. It's a privilege to be here at BC. Hear good things about you guys from Dan. This has something to do with the Trinity, but I'm not going to really say I don't think anything directly about it. I have bigger fish to fry in this talk. I started wondering about this in teaching a world religions class and also even studying Hinduism and Sikhism and Buddhism. But the way I'm going to introduce the topic is I'm going to give you some strange and puzzling quotations from legitimate, indeed good scholars and show you why there is a puzzle here. So the presentation is called On Counting Gods, Understanding Monotheism, Polytheism, and Atheism, although I'm going to jettison one of those terms later and uh, introduce some new terms. So you might think it's really easy to count gods. You got those prefixes that tell you how many. Monotheism is one god. Polytheism is many gods or more than one god. And atheism is no gods. Right, so what could be hard about that? The number of gods is either one, more than one, or zero. Okay, so here are some puzzles to get you worried about this. How many people have ever heard Buddhists or somebody talking about Buddhism say Buddhism is an atheistic religion? This is a continual refrain. I agree, actually, I think it is an atheistic religion. Okay, then why do you have scholars talking about the Mahayana pantheon? What's a pantheon? It's all the gods, right? Not wingnut scholars, not just, you know, my weird uncle or something, but like leading scholars that have good books on Mahayana Buddhism talk about the Mahayana pantheon. Also, if you actually read any Buddhist sources, even the earliest ones have some of the Indian gods in them, like Indra and Brahma. They make an appearance and they play a certain role in it. So don't they have gods? Here's a second problem. The, the kind of paradigm of a monotheistic religion in everybody's mind is Judaism. And you can find passages in the Hebrew Bible that mention many gods. One of them is Deuteronomy 10.17. Yahweh your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God. And there are other similar statements basically saying that he's the greatest of the gods and things like this. What's going on? I thought this was the paradigm of there's exactly one God. Maybe you've heard of this scholar, Dr. Paula Fredrickson, who has an article in which she says all ancient monotheists were polytheists. Now, when I first read this years ago, I thought, what, was there an outbreak of inconsistency in ancient times? Everybody thinks there's exactly one God and also there's more than one God. What, what could be going on here? Well, I actually think she's on to something, but I wouldn't put it quite the same way. Um, this guy is Dr. Carl Mosier. I did a really good couple of episodes of the Trinity's podcast with him. Talk about a knowledgeable guy. He's a biblical scholar, a student of Richard Baucom. Uh, he teaches in California now. Uh, one of the evangelical scholars who knows the most about Mormonism. And he's written about polytheism and monotheism in that connection. 
And he says in one place, counting gods cannot establish whether a theological tradition qualifies as atheistic, monotheistic, or polytheistic, despite the etymology. Wait a minute, what? Why do we have these prefixes if we're not counting gods? What is going on? Something's amiss here. One more problem. What about the person who says, I don't believe in a personal God? I don't believe in a personal God. I mean, isn't a God personal by definition? If it's something like all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good, don't those entail being personal? What is this person? Are they a monotheist? Are they an atheist? Are they something else? Well, I'm going to make a suggestion for that later. What I want to do is analyze concepts that I claim are what you might call ordinary concepts. I think not everybody has them, but they're found in all cultures, and whatever satisfies this concept goes by different names in different cultures. But I'm going to call it the concept of a deity. A deity has to be a self, it has to be a being who is in principle capable of having a first-person point of view and knowledge and performing intentional actions. A self is a someone. It's someone with whom uh, you might be able to have some kind of friendship. Right? A deity is somebody that could speak and be spoken to, is one way to put it. I think it's also a core part of the concept that a deity has to be more powerful than any ordinary human being when we're talking about actions that we think matter. So if you had a being with really extraordinary powers, you know, he could whistle the Star Spangled Banner in 0.5 seconds or it can make a really high-pitched note that no human could hear. If it was all bizarro powers like that, I don't think people would call it a deity. And I think it has to be greater in overall extent. So if you had some little fairy or some pixie or a leprechaun that can, uh, I don't know, produce gold out of thin air or create little grains of sand ex nihilo or something weird like this, I don't think we would call it a deity if it's the kind of thing that could be stepped on and killed by a small child. Uh, or easy, very easily outwitted. This part of the analysis I think is mushy, but I think that's how it's supposed to be because it's a common concept rather than a technical one that I've come up with for some explanatory purpose. Now, about having more power than any ordinary human has or a greater extent of power than any ordinary human, you might think, well, wait a second, this is obviously too wide a definition. You're going to make Superman a deity. And you don't want to have Superman or the Flash or Wonder Woman being deities, right? They're supposed to fall short of that. Yeah, I think that's right. So I think you have to add a third condition that they have to have supernatural power, which is the ability to intentionally act in ways not wholly constrained by nature's normal ways. Now Superman, right, he's supposed to be a guy from another planet, and I don't know, the gravity and the sun rays are different there, and somehow when you put him here, he's mega strong. And, but it's supposed to be natural powers is the point. It's just he's a fish out of water, and that's supposed to be what explains his powers. Other superheroes, you know, Spider-Man, he gets in a nuclear accident, and it tweaks his DNA or something like this. Superheroes are a lot like deities in mythology, but I don't think they're supposed to have supernatural power. They're just, they have a very unusual powers and kind of amazing powers. Now you might think, still, it's going to make all the wizards deities. Don't they have supernatural powers? You don't want to say Harry Potter's a deity, do you? No, I don't. I don't want to say that every wizard, every non-muggle in the Harry Potter series is a deity. But I think the difference is that a wizard is supposed to be somebody who is manipulating occult forces. Now, those may be like hidden laws of nature or something like that. Or they could be like a spirit or something which you're getting to do your bidding. But this kind of manipulation, which you can call magic, isn't supposed to be supernatural power. It's an unusual power. Now the thing that makes this a little bit messy is in some mythology there are deities, namely Shiva in Hinduism. There are stories in which he engages in ascetic practices like fasting and meditating and he builds up extra power that way. So he's doing the kind of thing that a yogi does in Hinduism to increase his powers. But I think that's okay. They're, those aren't his only powers. He still has powers even when he doesn't do these special occult manipulations. So the supernatural power is supposed to be something you can do directly, unilaterally, something that you can do on your own that's not constrained by nature's normal ways. 
like know what's going on at a far distance or fly or lift a whole mountain up with one finger like Krishna does in one of the legends or uh, heal somebody instantaneously, bring them back from the dead, knowing what people are thinking, those types of things. So if you put the three together, then in area A, you have superheroes, right? It's a self, which is more powerful than any ordinary human, but it's not supernatural power. And then in area B, I think you'd have nothing because if it's not a self, it can't perform intentional actions. And I'm talking about intentional actions, doing something for a reason. And I don't think like the force of Star Wars fame can like have reasons So I think probably there's nothing in Area B, but if you want to hold out that that's a conceptual possibility, okay, then I'm not sure what we would call things in that category. But I don't think we would call them deities. If you have something which is a self and has supernatural power, but which is not more powerful than an ordinary human being when it comes to the kinds of actions that we think matter, say a little leprechaun or elf or something like that, that still would be falling short of a deity And those would be the middle group, which meets all three conditions. So where is God supposed to go in here? Well, God is supposed to go in the middle because God in Christianity or in Islam or Judaism would would be all of those things. But you don't have to be anything like all-powerful and all-knowing or necessarily existing or existing not say. You might be just be a lousy old deified emperor who can grant wishes or give you good luck if you worship his statue or something like that. You would still count as a deity. You could be like one of the deities you see in Hindu mythology. You could be a Buddha or a Bodhisattva or the different deities in what are normally called polytheistic religions. Call this the generic concept of a god. I choose to call it a deity in distinction from a god. But before we talk about the monotheistic idea of a god, I think we should talk about an ultimate. And here's where I'm coining a term, though other people have used similar terminologies, like Schellenberg uses this term a little bit differently than I do. But what I mean by an ultimate is a being which is unique and unsurpassable in reality, like degree of reality and or kind of reality, and or an explanatory priority. So an ultimate is supposed to be sort of furthest back Some would say most real or highest degree of reality or the most basic or fundamental kind of reality if you go for those kinds of theses. Suppose you don't, like a lot of analytic philosophers don't go for different fundamental kinds or degrees of reality. Then it would just be, you know, what's at the farthest back explanatory level. It would be something that explains the cosmos maybe, but is self-explaining or unexplained, one of those two. So it's supposed to be the highest, so to speak, most basic, most real, farthest back. God in monotheism is supposed to be an ultimate. But also there are things talked about in religions like being itself or the Tao, etc. or Brahman. And those are supposed to be ultimate as well. It's consistent with being an ultimate that you're the only thing. But it's also consistent with it that you're just uh, sort of more real than other things or the source of other things or that type of idea. So it neither requires nor excludes being a self. That's the important thing about it, I think, that being ultimate neither requires being a self nor does it exclude being a self. So I want to analyze a concept of God like this, talking about the type of God that's discussed in monotheistic religions. It's got to be impossible by definition for there to be more than one God. And God is supposed to be ultimate. So for instance, Yahweh, Allah, and Vishnu in Vaishnavite Hinduism are supposed to be gods in this sense. Now why is it impossible for there to be more than one? Like impossible in principle. Stories will differ here but they never think it just so happens that there's only one. You know, it wasn't like Mr. and Mrs. God only had one kid 
and they decide it'd be too much work to have two. There isn't anything like that. It's for some reason necessary that there's only one. And uh, there are different arguments that you might give. There's three sort of types of ways of parsing belief in God or monotheism that I'm aware of. These are kind of families of views. So in perfect being theology, you might think, well, being absolutely perfect requires being omnipotent, and there couldn't be two omnipotent beings, because then if one tried to do something and the other tried to do the opposite, what would, what would happen then? Then neither would be all-powerful. That's one type of argument. Or more simply, if you believe there's an uncreated creator of all else, there couldn't be two of those, because then they'd be the creator of each other, but then they wouldn't be uncreated. So that'd be a reason why there couldn't be more than one God. In Eastern religions, it's maybe not as clear. They think that a lot of them that there's this ultimate which is hidden from ordinary experience. And I think they do suppose it's necessarily unique. There couldn't possibly be two of them. One idea would be if it's like a soul of the world, then there couldn't be two because being a soul of the world implies being in control of it and it couldn't have two beings be wholly in control of the one in the same world. That would be one idea. So maybe that type of idea, I'm not sure I've found any direct textual evidence of this, but maybe something like that would fit with Ramanuja's theology. But the important points are that it's defined as unique, necessarily unique, for some reason, and uh, a god is defined as ultimate. Not so with the deity, right? Now, what do we call this ultimate that's not a deity, that's not a god, that's because it's not a self? I choose to call it the ultimate with caps. Maybe this isn't the best name, but other people have used similar terms. John Hick calls it the real. Sometimes he calls it the ultimate. Sometimes he calls it God, which I think is a little confusing. There are many views that believe in an ultimate or the ultimate. The Tao, I think, is supposed to be this sort of thing. Brahman or Niguna Brahman, Brahman without qualities in Hinduism is supposed to be this. It's confusing because people who take this view will still refer to Brahman as God, but then it's clear they don't mean it to be a, a god or a deity. Although these are ones who are in conflict with the uh, Vaishnavite monotheists that I mentioned before. The real, according to John Hick, the one in Neoplatonism, I actually think this is Plato's view as well. He's got scads of gods if you read the Timaeus. He thinks all the stars are gods. He thinks there's a creator, the demiurge, right? That it's like the direct maker of the world. But none of these are ultimate. The ultimate, I think, is, a, is an it. It's the good, the form of the good. Later on, it gets called the one, but I think it's a similar idea. Arguably, being itself, this one's more controversial. Is God in Thomistic theology supposed to not be a God? That would be kind of disturbing. We can talk about that in the Q&A if you want. The absolute of absolute idealism and perennialism in the 20th century. Also, the ultimate is sometimes inversions of process theism. I mean, if this is right, then the, those particular process theists aren't theists. They're ultimists. So then this is the idea. If it's ultimate and the deity, then it's a god. That's what godhood is, uh, or at least it's, it's at least those two things. If something is an ultimate, it's not a god or a deity by definition. And then if you could talk about just a mere deity, something which is only a deity but not also a god. Okay, so what's all this getting at? Well, there's really three different kinds of things we can wonder about. Is there an ultimate? Is there a god? And how many deities are there? The ultimate is necessarily unique. A god is necessarily unique. The deities, there could be zero, one, or many of them. But there are some relations between them, right? If there's an ultimate, there's no god. And if there's a god, then, the, then there is no such thing as the ultimate. Ultimism and theism exclude each other. But both of them leave open the question how many deities there are. Now, if God exists, if there's a God, there has to be at least one deity, God. But the question is, are there also any mere deities? And generally speaking, the monotheist says, why, yes, there are. There's a whole bunch of them. That's the normal view. So this is my chart of the options, right? This is where a naturalist is. 
They think the number of gods is zero, the number of the ultimates is zero, and the number of deities is zero. So that's naturalism in the corner. Most typically, a Buddhist in Mahayana would believe in an ultimate, but in many deities, so he'd be in category seven. That's where the pantheon goes, but I'm going to call it a pandeon. And what about the Jew or the Christian? What about these passages in the Old Testament that say that Yahweh is the greatest of the gods? Well, the Hebrew word Elohim can refer to gods or to God, depending on the context. And Yahweh is supposed to be a deity, but he's supposed to be necessarily unique. The way this is put in books like Isaiah is, I'm the only God. Yeah, that's right, but it's talking about Godhood there. But he is supposed to be a deity. And they do think that there are angels. Angels can be called Elohim. Angels seemingly can do miraculous things. So angels are going to count as deities on this definition. So typically, a monotheist, uh, at least a Jew or a Christian, will be in this category. There's more than one deity, but there's one God, and the ultimate, well, there's no such thing. God is an ultimate, but he's not the impersonal ultimate. So those are three popular views I've just mentioned. These views across the middle are really unpopular, and I'm not going to say much about them. And the reason is, why would there only be one deity? The only person I can think of who's ever held one of these views, really, who's a, like a religious intellectual, would be maybe a early modern Unitarian like Joseph Priestley. So angels and demons, oh, that's just a bunch of hogwash. Don't believe that crap. But there's a God, sure. Okay, so then the number of deities is one. And the one deity is the one God. So that would put him in category five. But that's like a really rare view. You hardly ever find that among Jews and Christians. What about Muslims? Well, you've got Satan there. Can he do supernatural things? If so, he's going to count as a deity, it looks like. Calling something a deity doesn't mean you think it's essentially a deity. doesn't mean you think it's worthy of worship. It doesn't really mean that it's much like God, other than in those three ways that I mentioned. So Satan's going to count as a deity. Arguably, Paul in one place in the New Testament calls Satan the god of this world. Maybe he's saying that he's the deity who, uh, in some sense, is in charge of you know, the human evil domain who's going to be overthrown. Okay, so here's my terminology that I suggest. I'm trying to give a classificatory scheme for understanding religious worldviews, and I think that the common terminology is no good. Take just plain old monotheism. Some people that say they're monotheists are ultimists, and they really believe in an impersonal something or other. Some people who believe in monotheism believe in a perfect being, but they also believe in angels. Some people who believe in monotheism maybe believe that there's exactly one deity. Interestingly, atheism turns out to be an ambiguous term. The atheist is saying there's no what? Are they saying there's no God? Actually, that's how the term was coined in 17th century philosophy. The term atheism was coined to mean people who disbelieve in God. Okay, but it's a further question how many deities there are. So your philosophical naturalist, you could call that naturalistic atheism. The number of deities is zero. That entails that there's no God, but also there's no angels, demons, etc., or lesser deities. Okay, but here's another kind of atheism, what I call atheistic ultimism. So maybe some Zen people could fit into this category if they don't take the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas very seriously, if they think they're illusory and there's really just the true mind or something. They would be atheistic ultimists. There is the ultimate, but there isn't any deity, whatever. And so there's no God. This view in the corner ends up being incoherent. To say that the number of deities is zero and the number of gods is one, those two things don't go together because a god is by definition a deity. 
I guess there could be confused people in that camp, but it didn't seem very interesting to me, so I didn't give it a name. View three is monodeistic, non-ultimistic atheism. So it's a kind of atheism, but you've got a deity that's, you know, a lesser divine being would be one way to put it. Monodeistic ultimism, weird view. So they believe in the ultimate. and Maybe they think this emanates out a deity, which isn't ultimate. I don't know anybody that actually holds this. Five, you could call it austere monotheism because there's no deities. There's only the one God. Six, polydeistic, non-ultimistic atheism. So these people don't believe in any ultimate. They don't believe in God and they don't believe in the ultimate. But they've got deities. Who could be in this camp? I don't know. Maybe some people with traditional religions that aren't philosophical. They don't really think there's anything ultimate. Maybe. Seven I already mentioned as what I think is probably a majority Mahayana view, polydeistic ultimism. Of course, it's also a kind of atheism. This is by far the most popular kind of atheism in the history of the world. Naturalism is a newcomer. Right? Most people have believed in deities. Why? I think the reason that Epicurus gives, people say they experience them. And Epicurus, even though he's totally uninterested in religion, he thinks it's bad, he says, I'm, a, I'm an empiricist, so people say they experience deities, so I guess there are deities. But then he claims they're just irrelevant, they don't care what we do, and so on. Actually, I think Epicurus would be in group six, because he doesn't think anything's ultimate, but he believes in deities. And he's anti-religious as well. And then the eighth view is what most people, I think, that are called monotheists think. It's polydeistic monotheism. So I want to go back to those five problems I started with. Why do we say Buddhism is an atheistic religion? Is that right? Yes, that is true. It is atheistic because it says there's no type of being that the monotheists are talking about. They're right. They have always said that. There can be a kind of creator. They've got Brahma from Hinduism in there. They call him Brahma the creator. But he's not an uncreated creator. He's not an ultimate, right? So they're right. They've always been atheistic or almost always, unless you kind of elevate the Buddha to that position, which maybe happens sometimes. Yeah, it's atheistic almost by definition, but it's not an atheistic religion. Perhaps most Asian Buddhists are polydeistic ultimists. Now, all bets are off if you're talking about Western Buddhists. They might just be naturalists, and this is just a hobby to ease their mind and help them get along with their wife better and be less stressed out. But when you read Mahayana religion and metaphysics, you know, any of the famous Mahayana sutras, there's always some deep reality that they're interested in. And also the, uh, you know, the heavenly host of Buddhas or Bodhisattvas that will help you out if you call upon them and say their mantra and so on. So the Mahayana Buddhist pantheon is really a pandeon. It's a collection of all the deities. Now they don't call it that. The reason they don't call it that is because for them, the traditional deities, like the traditional Indian deities, are also in samsara. They're trapped in rebirth. Okay. But what they've effectively done is in inventing Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, they've invented two tiers of other deities that are higher, that are greater than the ones that are stuck in the crummy cosmos. Is this obnoxious to call these gods? Maybe, but look, when you're classifying, you can't only call things that you're classifying by what people call them. Okay, I'm also annoying the Christians that don't want to call angels deities. But I've defined what I mean by it, and I think it's... It's a decent definition. The Bible, Yahweh is the only God, but not the only deity. Traditional Jews and Christians have always believed in many angels and demons, good and bad deities. So that makes them polydeistic monotheists. What about Dr. Paula Fredrickson, who says that in antiquity, all monotheists were polytheists. Is that right? Well, that is, they were all or nearly all polydeists. Sure, believers in polydeistic monotheism. You know, arguably some of the pagans were as well. There are scholarly articles and monographs that talk about pagan monotheism. But of course, pagan monotheism does also have lesser dependent, derived, less powerful deities in it. Now, what about Dr. Carl Mosier, who said that whether or not a view counts as monotheism, doesn't, it just doesn't have to do with the number of deities or the number of gods. You can count 
gods, if you use my suggested terms. So monotheism means there's one god, but it leaves open the question of how many deities there are. There's at least one, because there's a god, but are there more? Monodeism is that there's exactly one deity, and that leaves open the question whether or not this is also a god. Atheism says there's no god, but that leaves open the question of deities. Adeism says there's no deity, and therefore no god. Polytheism says there's more than one god, but remember I said that by definition there can't be more than one god for some reason. They're defined as necessarily unique. So polytheism turns out to be a contradiction in terms, like Jewish pope or married bachelor. Polytheism says there's, there's more than one deity. So if you look at these three terms, monodeism, adeism, and polydeism, you are counting there. But the kind of thing you're counting is different than category of a god as understood in monotheism. So it does have to do with counting. But the way it has to do with counting is you get zero, one, or more than one when you're talking about the deity terms. If monotheism is true, there's one god. If ultimism is true, there are no gods. There isn't a god. So it's a kind of atheism. What about someone who says, I don't believe in a personal god? Sure, you believe in the ultimate, which is to say an ultimate which isn't a deity and so therefore isn't a god. You're an atheist. Whatever your views may be about deities, that's another question. If you read Indian philosophers, they talk about sometimes Hindus that are theists and Hindus that are atheists. And the ones they call atheists are the ones who believe that the ultimate is Nirguna Brahman, Brahman without qualities. It's an ineffable something. And they think at the level of illusion, there's Ishvara, the Lord. But it's a level of illusion. We're talking real. No, there isn't a God. There's the ultimate. Yeah, so those are atheistic Hindus. Although, on the level of practice, I mean, they look like they worship many deities. But they understand that in reality, there's this one ultimate. And then in contrast, you know, the monotheistic Hindus think that the one god is usually Vishnu or Shiva or the goddess. And on the face of it, clearly some Hindus worship multiple deities, whether or not they believe one of them is a god. So you might object, look, how can you have atheism that allows deities? This is just perverse. Graham Oppie, who's a really leading philosopher of religion nowadays, he defines atheism as that there are no gods. I think that's right if by gods you mean what I just said by God. But I don't think it's right if you mean no deities. We need a stronger term for that, like atheism. The way I'm using atheism is how it was coined. People like Henry Moore spoke of polytheism as a variety of atheism. And his idea is that none of the deities in traditional Greek and Roman religion are, are a perfect being. And he understands a god to be a perfect being. Okay, so then they're atheists. But they're atheists with hordes of deities, is how he thinks about it. Uh, I wouldn't call them polytheists, just because I want to reserve the term theism for talking about a god. But I call them polydeists. You see the same usage in Ralph Cudworth. And in the paper, I give some interesting quotations from Moore, where he's... He's discussing all this. So we're going back to the people who made the terms popular in English. The usage, I think, has become confused, but I think philosophers can help. How can you have monotheism when you got many deities? I mean, isn't that just obviously too many? Yeah, but any paradigm case of a monotheistic theology is going to have many deities. And honestly, the, the Jewish Bible, when it talks about the pagan deities, it assumes that they exist and that Yahweh's gonna triumph over them. Now it says they're nothing and they're less than nothing, but it also says that about like pagans and their cities and so on. So that's like a way of disrespecting them. You're less than nothing, sucks to be you. <laughs> a number of commenters have pointed this out, that this rhetoric, it actually assumes their existence while it's disrespecting them.
it assumes that when you know the Israelites are tearing down their idols, that it's disrespecting them. It's making these deities mad. Uh, and I already talked about monotheistic or austere monotheism, which is very rare to find in the world. One thing I think that constantly trips people up in various fields, theology, religious studies, or history, is to confuse issues of existence with issues of worship. And I want to say that monotheism does not imply monolatry. Now, if you want to use it that way, fine. But I think you're introducing confusion when you do. Monolatry is you worship exactly one. See, here's the thing. You can be a monotheist and be a lousy monotheist and not worship anybody. You're just a selfish person. You're a religious zero. But you believe in God. You really do. You just don't spend any time on Him. Here's another interesting fact. In lots of traditional African religions, they have a highest deity who seems to be something like an uncreated creator, necessarily unique being. Do they worship him? No. Or very rarely. Why? Oh, well, they've got these stories like, you know, it's like trying to see the president. You can't just walk, march up and say hello to Obama or soon to be Trump, right? You, you, they, won't, they won't let you in. If you go through this person, this person, this person, maybe eventually he'll get your message. So people get this idea about the high God, about the monotheistic God, and they think they have to deal with these little functionary deities, these little uh, bureaucrats or something. Or sometimes they think the creator sort of went on vacation or became uninterested or something. There's different stories there, but there are a number of interesting cases where it looks like theism, but they really don't worship that God most of the time. Monolatry does not imply monotheism. Look, you could be just a, a good old unthinking polydeist, but maybe you just really dig the goddess, and you just are devoted to her, and you kind of neglect all the other ones. So you're a monolater, but you're not a monotheist. How about the New Testament? What do you see there? Revelation chapter 5, Philippians 2, two objects of worship. In Revelation 4, they worship God. Revelation 5, they bring Jesus into the throne room and they worship God and Jesus on a different basis. They worship God for being the one God and the Creator, and they worship Jesus for His service to God. That's polyolatry, but it's also monotheism, because the one on the throne in Revelation 4 is the one God. Is Jesus a deity? After His resurrection and exaltation, it looks like He satisfies the concept of a deity. Yes, but you might, if you believe the traditional view about eternal generation, you probably should classify him as a deity on that basis. It might be super duper in power, but he exists because of another, then he's not going to be ultimate, but he might be a very powerful deity. Anyway, that's monotheism, but it's worship of more than one, even though the idea in the New Testament, as Paul says in Philippians 2, is that the worship given to Jesus sort of goes ultimately to God. And so it's kind of worshiping God directly and indirectly, although there are two objects. Polytheism is an oxymoron, yes, but that's okay. Nobody wants to be a polytheist. With a very few exceptions, there are a few people into kind of neo-pagan ideas that think polytheism is interesting. Actually, I do agree that polydeism is interesting. I think it's a neglected topic that philosophers should think about and argue about. Polytheism, we can just scrap it. That's okay. They're not saying there's more than one of the same kind of thing that monotheists are talking about or just theists are talking about. They're not saying there are two of those. So why polytheism? Polydeism is better. Lastly, advice for my atheist friends. Naturalism implies atheism, but atheism does not imply naturalism. If you've proven that there's no God, you still have on the table belief in the ultimate which may have also scads of deities. Also, naturalism is a newfangled kind of atheism that historically was never popular. It always just seemed too ridiculous for people to say that matter just happened to come together this way, but Darwin basically made the world safe for atheism, and some types of cosmology try to give him an assist in the current day. But I mean, you hardly find any naturalists in the ancient world. But you find tons of atheists, but they're believers in deities. So if you disprove God's existence, it doesn't prove there aren't any deities. Naturalism does imply atheism. So it looks like if what people are calling atheism means no divine beings of any sort, no matter what you mean by deity, okay, fine. If you want to use it that way, that's okay. 
I want to use it more strictly like it was coined. Call that atheism. Um, it looks like you should argue for naturalism then because naturalism is supposed to sweep the field not only of God but of any kind of powerful self that has supernatural power. I think that's an interesting result of this. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. I guess the, the obvious thing that comes to mind for me is it seems like uh, there could be some trouble fitting the notion of Christ in this as God-man, sort of what you do with that. And so just for me, thinking of a specific example, thinking about someone like Rahner, who I would say is an ultimist, coming out of a Thomistic tradition, viewing God as the ground of being, not an entity of the world, right? but also simultaneously understanding it as sort of mediated through Christ historically. What category do you fit that into? Yeah, on the face of it, it looks like ultimism with at least one deity, the deity being the same self that's the man, Jesus. So it's a kind of Christian atheism. This is what I got into an argument with Ed Fazer about. I mean, leaving Christianity aside for one moment, which we can come back to, I mean, it seems to me that ultimism is like the perennial natural enemy of theism. Some people have really strong views for one and against the other. That goes against the grain of Christian history, though, because of the strong Platonic and Neoplatonic influence. And so you have all these people saying, the good. Well, yeah, that's what we mean by God, pretty much. It's the good. So John Scotus Ereugena, God is beyond being and not being. I mean, that's definitely ultimism, the way I'm thinking about it. So if Christ is a real self, and I don't think everybody thinks that, by the way, but if Christ is a real self, and also he's the direct creator of the world, and uh, maybe is omniscient and eternally so, then he's going to be a deity. But if he exists because of the Father, he's not going to be an ultimate. And if we want to say in the final analysis that God is such that no concept directly applies to it, then... I don't think that's theism. I think it's ultimism. The concepts I was talking about, I think, do apply to God the way that theists mean it. Now, people like Ed Fazer, who's a strong conservative Catholic, but in my view, an atheist of this sort, <laughs> he ridicules what I call theism as theistic personalism. And he thinks it's a lamentably anthropomorphic view. But look, it's not literally anthropomorphic. There can be a non-physical self, but it's not five foot ten and has arms and legs and hair and all this. It's just that it's a self. It, it has knowledge and will and can speak and be spoken to. So if you want to call that anthropomorphism, I think that's a little much. The partisans of classical theism and philosophy, in my view, they're ultimists if they don't have God being a self. Would Christ be understood as a deity separate from God, or would God be both a God and a deity? See, I think there's a clash between the New Testament and this kind of Thomistic wing of the tradition. In the New Testament, God is unequivocally a self, like literally a self. And so that's why he speaks and is spoken to, and he has plans that get fulfilled and things like this. The thing about Christian monotheism after the time of like Isaiah is generally they reserve the term God only for the one God. They change the older tradition where they would call lesser deities Elohim, mere deities Elohim. They stop doing that. They want to emphasize Yahweh's uniqueness so much that they decide to reserve God talk almost always for him. However, in the New Testament, they extend it some, a little bit to Jesus here and there. They call him the one Lord. Arguably, they call him God in a small handful of passages like Hebrews 1, quoting the psalm, Your throne, O God, is forever. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. Right, so 
it's clear that the one being called God at first is someone other than God. That's okay. We use titles ambiguously like that. You might call the colonel leader and the general leader, and it's not necessarily confusing. The New Testament, being that this is the case, pretty much just reserves God talk for the Father in all but a really small handful of cases. In my view, it's just a couple. But it depends how you translate a few and how you uh, take the text on a few cases. And that's because it straight up teaches that the one true God is the Father. And Jesus is a human who's the Messiah and is, at least after his exaltation, worthy of worship and is divine. But, you know, it says that in Second Peter that the saved are partakers of the divine nature. So there's a theme of theosis. Salvation is deification. Not to the same status as Christ exactly, because he's been put in charge of the whole world and given whatever powers that takes. But still, on this scheme, the exalted Christ and the raised and exalted believers would count as so many deities, although not really strictly equal. It seems like this has already now nicely come out in the discussion, but it does strike me that a consequence of your view is you get this pretty sharp contrast. So people like Tillich maybe would be classified as ultimates. And that, Absolutely, um, yeah. You know, I mean, I guess talking to Rabbi Sam Labens this summer, it seems to me that even though he affirms that Yahweh is a person, he acknowledges sort of space within the Jewish tradition to deny that or say that it applies like only analogously in the case of God, something like that. And so I do wonder, I mean, there'd be another way of even talking about some of the same ideas that you are that would see the affirmation of God as kind of a particular kind of ultimism, right? I mean, it's, there is a sense in which the traditional Judeo-Christian God is still an ultimate, but you're defining them in sort of mutually exclusive ways. If yeah. you went the other way... The um, ultimate is by definition not a God. But God is an ult he is ultimate. He has the quality of right. being ultimate. Yeah. Right. That's but, kind of unfortunate I'm using the word in those two ways, but I don't have a better word. Yeah. But you might think that there would be space for argument, say, within a uh, religious tradition like Judaism or Christianity about whether or how attribution of personal qualities apply in the case of God. I mean, that's yeah. so far apart. It's just, well, I they're mean, pretty far. I mean... They're as far as atheism and theism are apart. That's a big difference. The one who believes in the ultimate is an atheist. I understand what you're saying. They're both anti-naturalists because they have something beyond the natural world that's ultimate. They're equally odious in the natural size, maybe, but the fact that wildly different views can be in the same religious tradition, I think that's right. I think there's a simplifying assumption that you see in apologetics and theology and to a lesser extent in religious studies that you get one theology per tradition. Okay, and this is a Christian idea for mainstream Christianity. But we already knew this isn't true. Like in some sense, the Christians that don't believe in any supernatural, in some sense they're Christians, right? They're sociologically undeniably within that realm. And then you got, you know, atheist Jews, tons of them i got a couple of colleagues and friends that are atheists, but they're totally Jews. Is that the standard? No, but it's correct to have this cross-cut religious classifications. It might strike some people that, is this really worth disputing about? I think it is, because it's the difference between atheism and theism. Yeah, but the disagreement might be as close as to turn on, like, two people agree on let's say, everything except for, you know, they have different views about how personal language applies in the case of God as opposed to others. I mean, and that's like the one thing they disagree about. I mean, it just seems like this way of setting the debate up terminologically makes them seem like they're farther apart than they appear to me to be. Just, uh, I think the doctrine of analogy muddies the waters mm -hmm. on this, as well as other things in other religions. So I described Advaita Vedanta as atheistic and said that Ishvara, the personal Lord, God is at the level of illusion. Yeah, that's what they say, but they also, some of them definitely think there's a degree of reality there, but it's a degree that you should try to transcend. So in a sense, they think there's a God. In another sense, they think there isn't a God, and it gets mushy. 
What makes it mushy is they've got something that neither exists nor doesn't exist. This thing in the middle, that's a god. That's one thing they say about it. So, I mean, the doctrine of analogy is a big can of worms. It's a can of worms, what the best version of it is, and even what Aquinas means by it. But if it turns out to be something like, we don't think God's a person, but you can sort of think of him that way, or think of it that way, then, okay, that could be a type of atheism. To say that something is impersonal but appears personal in some circumstances, it is what it is, right? Like if you have a view where this impersonal, ineffable, ultimate, sometimes when you interact with it, you might sort of hallucinate that it's speaking to you. I'm not saying this is what Thomas think. I'm not saying this is what anybody thinks. But if you had a view where when you experience the ultimate, you might sort of project that it's speaking to you, Hicks' view is similar to this, then that's still ultimism right? Because it's just how you're mistaking it. And if you're a theist and you think that somehow you could just experience the personal God impersonally, you'd still be a theist. It's just that you think there's this different kind of religious experience that's sort of not as revealing as another kind. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, I just think if you're defending a view that ends up classifying, say, conservative Catholics who see themselves as part of the Christian tradition as atheists. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's a question there about, you know, <laughs> whether whether they should go in your classification or, mm-hmm. or whether, you know, whether yours is to be rejected rather than... At the end of the paper, in a footnote, I give a, an alternative terminology that might be less odious to them. But look, sometimes it's hard to figure out what people actually think, you know. Somebody might pound the table with all the being itself stuff and turn right around and pray to God and try to convince him of something. So what do they actually believe? They probably believe that God is a person. And I would expect a lot of Catholic Christians to fall into that view. So it's kind of like in the philosophy seminar room, you say one thing, but your actual views are a bit different. It's like the person who sounds like a moral relativist in the philosophy classroom, but clearly somebody steals their car, they think it's just objectively wrong. So they're not really a relativist, not consistently. It's messy. If you believe in an ultimate, then what you think is the correct way to relate to it is not worship or prayer understood as talking, having a conversation, hoping to hear back something. What they do with the ultimate is they try to have a special religious experience of it, which is non-conceptual. So like in Zen, for instance, they try to completely still their mind. He thinks that he has seen at rare times that really there's just the one. It's all really the one. And so he doesn't pray to the one for his daily bread. And Sankara, he thinks that the sages, the really wise, are the ones who, you know, withdraw from the senses and manage to see that Atman is Brahman, which is an experience that people don't ordinarily have. So I think that's one way to tell like what somebody really thinks. People want to get really fancy and say that God's a person in some highly refined sense. I think that's wrong-headed. The idea of a self is an off-the-shelf part of the human conceptual equipment. That's why when the Buddhists say they believe in the no-self doctrine, we all know what they mean. You don't believe in this thing which exists and lasts through time performs actions and is a subject of consciousness and so on. They claim there isn't one of those. So even people that don't believe that officially don't believe in selves have, I think, this concept. And it's clear to me that competent users of personal pronouns have this concept. But then these are the people who think that God is a self. They're constantly using singular verbs and personal singular pronouns and they use a proper name. So I think a really consistent ultimist thinks that worship is kind of pointless. Or it's not the deepest or the best approach, at least, if it's not totally pointless. Like, Sankara thinks that people who aren't advanced are going to pursue devotional religion, worshiping personal deity with an idol like Hindus typically do. That's what he thinks, but that's not what he's interested in. That's how I understand him. Do some Catholic people think that? I mean, philosophers? Probably, yeah. Probably some of them do think that. Ordinary people? I think it's pretty rare.
touched on this issue of worship and was curious about where, say, in the maybe definition of a deity or something like a god, that what sort of role, maybe fittingness for worship or something like that, is that something that totally perhaps comes from the side? Yes, thank you. This is a really important question. So I don't define a deity as worthy of worship, particularly like worthy of worship for anyone. That, that's just wrong. Like the mythologies are full of deities that don't seem particularly important and that most people should not worship because they only patronize one little ethnic group or something. Or there are deities that get killed or just seem like really like minor supporting characters. If you're a god, does that entail that you're worthy of worship? I think it does in the two Western ways that I mentioned of explaining it. So if you're a perfect being, then you should be honored because you're utterly, absolutely perfect in every way. So I think that entails being worthy of honor, which is what I think worship is. And if you're the uncreated creator of all else, you and I have been the beneficiaries of all this generosity. And I think that that entails that we owe gratitude and honor to God. I'm not so sure about the one sort of self in the universe, but I think you also should be careful to not think that any being worthy of religious worship has to be so by their essence or something like that. I don't think that's right. I mean, honor is just honor. Sometimes you have to honor somebody because of the relation that you've entered into with them. So say you're adopted you thereby have to honor this, these people as your parents. But there's nothing, there's like no intrinsic connection between you and them. And so I think in the New Testament, Jesus is supposed to be honored because he's been exalted to God's right hand. This is what the scholar Larry Hurtado has said in many places, that the earliest Christians worshiped Jesus out of obedience to God because they thought that God, to, for God to exalt him entails that he is to be worshiped because he's kind of sharing God's throne, or he's on the same level as it. But that's not necessarily by his essence, but it's, it's by his position that he was given. Yeah, I want to go back to um, the theism versus uh, ultimism line there. And I was, when we were talking, I was thinking about um, Augustine's two Platonic ascents in Book 6 and the the Confessions. And when Augustine it seems, uh, interacts with God, he, in the Confessions, he's interacting with a, a definitely a self, you know, it's a very personal relationship. Yep. But when, in the Platonic Ascents, and he sort of encounters God with his mind, it's definitely not a self in the way he describes it. It's very Platonian, it's very Platonistic, and so how would you, I, I think that's, on your view, would be some sort of tension, at least. I guess I just think Augustine was confused. <laughs> yeah, I mean, clearly he thinks God is the Trinity, and clearly he thinks that this God is a self because he's constantly talking to him. Right. And, uh, but we do have to remember that he, convert, he basically converted to Platonism first and never really kind of unconverted from it. So that left him with the view that you can have access to God if you can just manage to withdraw from your senses enough and maybe even move through the forms to the, uh, the ultimate source of them. Although I'm not sure he has that much much that idea like Plato does, but it's not clear to me what's what's going on there. It looks to me like a mix of ultimism and theism that doesn't make sense. So you can put it in both boxes. Yeah. If theism is true, why should you be able to perform this platonic ascent? And maybe you can, maybe you can't. It's not part of the Bible, I think, that you can. Not on the way the Platonists mean it. Justin Martyr, he's an earlier guy who first converted to Platonism. And he said that he would spend a lot of time contemplating the forms, hoping that he was going to soon see God. I don't think he really changed his view either. He still seems to have this ultra-transcendent view of God that comes out in funny ways in his uh, theology. But at the same time, he thinks that the one God is the Father Almighty, like in the New Testament and in the early creeds. So I, I see the kind of tension there too. I guess is what I expect from a Platonist. Plato's been so beloved in Christian tradition, but I think he's really an atheist. <laughs> Even though he's got scads of deities, you know, if you read the Timaeus, he's, nobody knows how seriously he really takes that whole yarn, but it's got lots of deities. He talks about atheism like it comes in degrees. It's really atheism, I think. You could be an atheist in, insofar as you're kind of dissing the deities of this particular town. 
where he talks about you can be an absolute atheist, which he thinks there should probably be the death penalty for in the laws, he says this. It's not the atheism that matters. I don't think that matters to him at all. It's the ADism that makes him mad. How would three self and one self Trinitarians be classified by you? The one self view is kind of unproblematic in that it's going to be theistic because that one self will be a god. And I think probably the one self view is the majority view. So when theologians say, well, they didn't mean persons in the modern sense of a person, what they mean by the modern sense of a person is a self. And I deny that it's modern. I think everybody's always had this concept. Descartes did not magically invent this in the 1600s. So, you know, people like Bart and Rahner, they think of God as a self. They want to stop all this talk of three persons and suggest modes of being or something like that. So they're going to come out theists or monotheists on this view. The three self views are a mess. And I'm not sure there is any obvious place they fit. None of these can be necessarily unique, right? So is it tridism? If it was if there were three merely mere deities and there's no god, Trideism of that kind would be a kind of atheism. It'd be in uh, number six, polydeistic, non-ultimistic atheism. Yeah. Now that looks like it would be a disaster. Okay, but then Swinburne, for instance, he has the father being qualitatively like the other two, but they derive from him. So only the father is, is an ultimate. Okay, well then the father is a god, and the other two are deities then, even though very powerful deities. But they don't quite have godhood because they don't have ultimacy. So then it'd be eight. But that's familiar territory. And I think he would have a lot of other people in that camp, like Tertullian and Origen, I think, are both in that camp. I don't think that's right myself, but that's another conversation. Hasker, he tries to sort of pull monotheism out of the hat somehow by emphasizing how person-like the three of them are going to be. But they're not literally going to be a person. They're not, they're not literally going to be a self. But, you know, he throws in perichoresis and constitution and stirs it all around. I mean, he's trying to get the three of them to amount to a god, but I don't think it works. An equally difficult question is, what about people who just refuse to clarify and they just repeat the formulas? Where would those fit in? It's just a mystery. It's three persons in one being. And what do we mean by that? We have no idea. What about, like, if they fasten on that one famous passage in Augustine and they just camp out there? Like, we only say three persons. We don't know what else to say or something like that. They're being more vague than a Christian should be, I think, is what. Right, because is there a God among, in there among this group or not? Is the whole thing a God? Is one of them a God? If so, you're a theist. If there aren't any gods to be found there, you're an atheist. What kind of atheist you are might depend on what you say about the persons exactly. So yeah, the Trinity's kind of a mess, but that wasn't my main aim in uh, coming up with the scheme. My main aim was to try to come up with a well-motivated classification that changes the terms as little as possible, that looks like it could apply to Sikhism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and all the other isms. That's what I was trying to do. I mean, given that people mean so many different things by the Trinity, I, that seems to me like it's the right result, that it should come out in different places depending on what they say. So one thought I had in sort of thinking about this, especially as you just sort of recounted the motivation for this, is perhaps one danger. Uh, I'm reminded of a, a line that Chesterton had about people describing all the world religions that he said, like, if you put enough things that sort of look like each other together, you'll get them to look alike. And his example is he wanted a list of all the nomadic nations in the world. He starts like the Hebrews maybe the Egyptians, the Mongols, and then you put like the French next to them because like, they marched all the way to Russia, and then you start with you know, the British who had all the colonies. So perhaps, maybe I should just say, like I might be one of those perhaps inconsistent 
conservative Catholics like Dr. Fazer who were banging on the table about the act of, to be itself. Mm -hmm. Go pray mm -hmm. the rosary later. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> But one of the things I think is maybe not all of the world's religious tradition uh, would have uh, maybe a, a notion of mystery to you know, the religious beliefs, which might be very intellectually unsatisfying. But uh, did you say they don't have an idea of mystery? Well, I don't. They might not even. Well, maybe I'll just say we. I beg to differ. <laughs> well, I, I then fair, I mean, fair enough. They they probably do. But the point of that is. Uh, just that in talking about, say, whether or not the Trinity makes sense to say, you know, is there a God somewhere in there, or perhaps mm -hmm. what some of the, maybe there are there are problems, and certainly the doctrine of analogy is fuzzy, but I think, um, not, while not familiar with your exchange with Dr. Fazer, perhaps what his reason for calling the view anthropomorphic was that if the analogy, or depending on which way it works, you're going to either end up with, you know, a God that looks just like mm -hmm. human beings, it just maybe slightly better. But in saying that God is a person, at least Aquinas himself would say God's not a person the same way that we're a person, certainly not a self the same way that, say, the angels are, and that that might, you know. Yeah, I mean, against too much concern with anthropomorphism, I would say that the statement, let us make man in our image and likeness, never mind if you believe in a historical Adam or not, I don't think it matters. But I, because I think it's supposed to be teaching something about God and humankind. And what it's saying is that the humans are like God, but then likeness is symmetrical. God is then therefore like the humans. Now, if you ask how is that meant, well, that's an interesting question. I mean, there are scholars who claim that in the Jewish Bible, in some sense, God has a body. But anyway, without opening that can of worms, I mean, the, the more traditional interpretation is we're like God in being intellectual and moral beings. So it's like a spiritual similarity. Okay, good. But then, but that's why he speaks to people and is spoken to. And that's why he gets personal pronouns. It's quite different than the Tao or Brahman and the Upanishads. All right, we should thank Dale again. Thanks a lot, folks. Today's thinking music has been Circle Round by Spinning Clocks. If you enjoyed this episode of the Trinity's Podcast, don't forget to share on social media like Twitter, Pinterest, and Facebook. And speaking of Facebook, you're welcome to join us in our very active Facebook group. It's called Trinity's Podcast, and it's at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. For listening, we'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind. <laughs>